Hello everyone, my name is Killian. I am an experienced designer and creative facilitator at Naked Ambition. And today I'll be guiding you through the first part of our bootcamp, which is the webinar. So for the coming 45 minutes, I'm gonna to talk to you all about design thinking. And um, so I suggest you grab a cup of coffee, glass of water, grab a notebook, sit back and relax, and let's get started. So first up, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country because although this is a virtual workshop, part of it is still being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and Naked Ambition likes to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. We would like to pay our respects to the elders past and present and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be present today or may be watching this. Um, then I'd like you to grab that notebook or post it and think for a minute about what you want to get out of today's webinar. What are the questions you have around design thinking, the things that you've always wanted to know, um, or what do you expect for me to tell you over the coming 45 minutes? Please write that down um, because afterwards, after these 45 minutes, you can now reflect on that um, and maybe if there's things that I haven't mentioned, things that I haven't um, brought to your attention, always shoot us a message or an email and we'd love to get back to you as soon as possible. So write those things down, pause this video for a second, and then we can continue. So let's start all the way at the beginning with a definition. I think that's the best way to start. So design thinking, our definition of design thinking is that it is a methodology and a mindset for solving complex problems and identifying opportunities that put humans first. I know that's a mouthful, so let's look at it again. A methodology, which means that it's a clear step-by-step -step approach. And a mindset, which means that it also talks about a way of thinking for solving complex problems, which oftentimes is problems with a lot of stakeholders, um, with not just one viewpoint and identifying opportunities, which means that we're not just looking at that problem, but switching it around, seeing what are the underlying opportunities that are in that problem that puts humans first. I think that's essential. It looks at what humans need, what humans want, and then looks at the problem through that lens. We call it also the human-centered lens of design thinking. So if you look at that definition, you can see that it has gained a lot of popularity in the last few years. And we believe, especially in this time that we're in right now, um, a mindset and a methodology to solve complex problems is quite important. Um, we're in quite a complex world right now and we're dealing with a lot of complex problems um, and looking at that through a human-centered lens and identifying opportunities in those problems um, it's something that we can all learn from and need a little bit of. So that's our definition of design thinking. Now I'd like to play a little clip, I'll insert it here. Um, and the clip is from Tom Kelly, who is a partner at IDEO. And IDEO is often coined as the people or the company that founded the principles of design thinking. Now, of course, the principles of design thinking were uh, already there for number of years, but IDEO is the one company, the design agency that really uh, coined that phrase and then started to show the methodologies and mindsets all over the world. So Tom Kelly's a partner and he's going to tell you a little bit about it. One thing about design is I think it's, I think it's really helpful to think of it as a mindset as opposed to a thing, right? As soon as you think of design as a thing, then you get into the word designer, as in designer light switch, designer coffee cup, right? And, and so it's this thing, and it, it boxes design into a pretty narrow space. Whereas if you think of it as a mindset, or even a tool set, but a, a kind of a mindset that you use to focus on any kind of problem or challenge in the world, then wow, it opens up design to do a lot more than you know, making nice coffee cups. Right, so that is um, a beautiful explanation of Tom Kelly of design thinking being a mindset and a tool set. It's talking about mindset. So let's unpack a few of those mindsets that we think 
um, design thinking needs to have or that we think design thinking deals with. The very first mindset is empathic, an empathic mindset. Now, empathy means that you are aware of someone's needs, feelings, experiences, without that person necessarily having to tell you what they've gone through. That's in my words. Um, and that is a very important thing about design thinking. We look at the people that we're designing for, the people that might be part of a problem or might be part of an opportunity. Um, and we really look at their experiences and their wishes and their feelings. Um, and all of that is taken into account when we tackle a certain problem and when we look for solutions. So an empathic mindset is very important. Second mindset that we like to address is optimistic, an optimistic mindset. Now I know that we are dealing with complex issues, complex problems. So it can get really hard to be optimistic and it can get really easy to um, don't really see the forest for the trees. So being optimistic is a very important part of the design thinking process and trusting the process, trusting in an optimistic and good result in the end. The third mindset is embracing ambiguity. Um, and I think especially in this day and age, that's an important one because ambiguity is all around us. It's the uncertainty of things. It is things keep changing all the time. There's no clear definition of what a thing is. Um, and all of that is the times that we're in nowadays. And instead of fighting that, of going against that, it's about embracing that. Embracing that everything changes all the time and going with that. The fourth one is tangible, being tangible. Um, and being tangible may, means try to get things out of what's in your head. So if we're thinking about a solution or if we're talking about a problem, for instance, try to draw it, try to draw a stakeholder map, try to map all the people that are involved, try to quickly build something, try to make ideas and topics that you talk about as tangible as possible. Because in this way, we can express our thoughts to as many people as possible. And it's not just in our heads, but it's outside of it. An iterative mindset is also very important. I think I'm going to keep on saying very important to all these mindsets. Um, but iterative means that there's no end of the process. Design thinking is not a process that you start here, I finish there, and that's it. It's always iterative, so it's almost a circle. It's every time that you are in a solution, there's always point, room for improvement. There's always room to go through the full process again and making it iterative. Um, so seeing something as not being finished, but as being something that can always improve, um, depending on the feedback you get, for instance, from users, that's a mindset that you'd like to be in. Um, experimental is a mindset that is um, very important within design thinking methodologies. Um, and experimental just means um, The sixth one is experimental. So experimental ties into being tangible and iterative. It's about creating experiments. We can talk and debate as much as we want about different solutions or different ideas, but before we experiment with it, we don't really know what it's gonna look like. One of the experiments that we have now today is this setup um, might look pretty professional from here, but if I would switch the camera around, you would see that it's one big experiment. So that is experimental mindset. And the last one, and I think the most important one, is collaborative. Um, a design thinking process is something that you don't go about by yourself. It's not an individual thing that you do. Um, you do it with a theme, and not just the whole team, but also involving the users, involving the people that you're designing for, involving different stakeholders. It's bringing in as many diverse perspectives as possible to look at a problem. Because we can think of a solution from the problem from our perspective, but that would just solve it for one person and for one experience. But we want to solve it for a global experience or 
a big experience at least. So bringing as many people as possible, make it as diverse as possible and as collaborative as possible, which granted can be hard to do in this virtual way of working, but you'll see now in interactive workshops that we have tools for that one. Now, we talked about mindsets. Tom Kelly talked about his definition of design thinking. We gave you our definition. So now it's time to look at some examples because that's the best way to learn. So I've got three examples lined up for you. One is a product example of product design, design thinking project. And the other two are municipalities who embrace the design thinking approach, which would be interesting in this case for you, Kingston. Um, so let's go back to the very first example, which is the Heinz ketchup bottle. I think all of you remember the glass Heinz ketchup bottle that most of us had up to a few years ago. Um, it was a staple product, signature product within the Heinz family. Um, and if you think about how you used it, I know a lot of you guys are doing this now. <laughs> So what you did is you took the bottle and you tried to get the ketchup out, right? So maybe you had flashbacks of your mom and dad being angry because the ketchup went everywhere or of the crusty top at the top of the bottle that was not really pleasant to look at. Um, so all of that has to do with the experience of using that glass bottle, right? But like I said, it was a signature piece. It was the example of Heinz in the minds of a lot of people. Um, but up to a few years ago, nothing had changed. And then the new head of design came in and he wanted to redesign this product. Um, and not just redesign it in a new and fancy way, but really look at how people are using it. So what he did is he, together with a team of designers, started observing people using this bottle. What they realized, which probably doesn't surprise you, is that the biggest users of the bottles in households are children. And like I said, the flashbacks of your mom and dad getting angry because the ketchup went everywhere is real. Children can't really use the glass bottle as well. So after these observations, they went out to design or redesign a new bottle, which became the plastic squeezy bottle um, and sales went up after they released it with 19% um, and the following year they kept on iterating and they saw that with the bottles you always still had to do this although it was plastic now so you could do this but the ketchup would always be on the wrong end so they flipped the bottle around this way the ketchup is always at the bottom is where you want it to be so the new design is now widely available everywhere and it has improved the way that we use. The second example takes us all the way to Denmark. Now in Denmark, there's this thing called municipality kitchens, which means that um, if you don't, aren't in a position to make your own food, to go to the supermarket, have a kitchen, then the municipality delivers food to your door. An amazing concept. Um, but there were some tricky things with this concept. Um, and in the municipality of Holstebo, I hope I say that correctly, um, they hired a design agency to look at this concept again. And their brief was, we think the menu needs a redesign. We think that we need some extra dishes. People aren't as happy with our, um, with our concept. So, can you please come in and see what extra dishes we need to put on the menu? That was the brief that the design agency got. And of course, the design agency went in and they didn't just look at the menu, but they looked at the full experience and interviewed all of the different stakeholders involved in this product. So they, different, they interviewed the elderly, but they also went into the kitchens. And they looked at the people creating the food and they looked at the people delivering the food because all of that is part of the system. And what they saw is that the elderly weren't really happy with the food being delivered. It didn't really have to do a lot with the actual food itself, but it had to do with the interaction that they had with the people delivering it. It was a very quick, very brief interaction that 
wasn't really human. And then they looked at the people delivering the food and they saw that the people were on such a crazy schedule and rush that they didn't have time to properly set up maybe a table for the elderly to properly actually guide them through the experience of getting the food. And then they looked at the kitchens and they saw that the people were not necessarily proud of the food that they were giving out because it was all such a rush, because it was also not really well packaged. Everything that they put out was something more of, a, of, of an industry than it was actually of a restaurant. And that's where it clicked. The experience needed to be more like a restaurant experience. So what they did is they redesigned the packaging of the food, they redesigned the, the kitchens, the way that the people actually process the food, and then redesigned the experience, uh, the delivery experience. And this way, the people working in the kitchens were really proud of the food that they were actually giving out to the elderly. The people delivering the food had time to set up the table and really create a beautiful experience for the elderly. And a menu with them and the elderly then felt okay to give them feedback, to talk about what they'd like to see in the menu, to actually have a bit of a conversation, to all make it more human, right? And that way now it's a constantly iterative process where people can have input in what they'd like to see. People are proud of what they're delivering, so they constantly want to actually make it better. And it became a system that is constantly improving all through design thinking. A third example is the Singaporean government who actually hired IDEO, Tom Kelly's company, or is a partner of the company, but they hired them to redesign a lot of different processes in the government. And one of them was the employment pass application because the employment pass application process was a mess. There were 13 steps that people had to go through. They had to deliver documents, go to different um, buildings to sign up, um, go through an online portal. There were all these different ways of doing it and they wanted to redesign this process. And what I deal with is, instead of looking at all of the things that the municipality needed from the people, they started observing what the people needed. They started observing how the people went through the process, how the people had to set up everything online, how the people had to go through the different buildings, what the buildings looked like, how they were waiting in the waiting rooms. All of that stuff was important. And all that stuff contributed to the experience of people wanting to apply for a job or start to work in Singapore. And you can imagine if the very first point of contact is a system that is broken, that doesn't set you up for success to start working there. So IDEO got rid of the 13-step plan and it was now more viewed as an individual way of tackling this process. So people went to the building, which was redesigned not as a warehouse almost, but you got your own booth and there was a person that would guide you through the full process. The portal was redesigned, not in a way that you had to go through all the questions, but as a way of almost a coach that would guide you through the different steps. So all of it was seen from the perspective of the user and the success rate therefore went up. So people actually needing help to go through the process went all the way down. So it's not just giving everything that the customer needs, it then also impacts how much time you later on have to spend in fixing all the problems. So those are three examples of design thinking in the field. Um, and I'd like to go to the actual methodology behind all of it, which is called the double diamond. Um, and as you can see in this visual, there's two diamonds in a double diamond. Um, and the double diamond is one of the methodologies, one of the processes visualized in design thinking that we use. Um, but there's a lot of different ones. And this is from the British, British Design Council. Um, and I think it's the most widely used method of design thinking. But as you can see, it has two diamonds and it therefore has two phases. We have the problem phase, which is the phase where we stick with the problem, which is the phase where we unpack all of the things happening in that problem. 
before we then go over to the solution space, which is the second phase. So this is almost the main thing about design thinking is that we stick with that problem phase for a little bit. And that's not something that we're used to as humans, right? If you're in the classroom and the teacher asks you a question, the best of class raises their hand the fastest. Um, so we are almost trained to go to problem to go to solution space as quickly as possible. But design thinking says no, we need to stick with the problem for a little while and unpack that before we move over to solution. Which makes sense. So apart from those two phases, there's another model that comes into play with design thinking, and that is the three lenses of innovation. So if you look at your own organization, a lot of the times when we practice innovation, we look at three different aspects. Maybe the very first one that we look at is feasibility. Does something work? Can we get something to work? Can something actually be done? Right? We look at all the things that are, uh, that, that are feasible before we make a decision. Second thing that we look at is viability. Does something bring value both to us, but also to the user? Is something viable? Can we get revenue from it or are we at least not losing revenue from it? And then the third lens is desirability. What do our customers or our users need? Now in traditional innovation, the feasibility and viability lens were use most often for innovation come to life. And design thinking says we start with desirability. Now that doesn't mean that we don't look at feasibility or viability, those are really important as well, but we start the design process with what do users want? What do our humans want? What is it that we need to give them? Now within those two phases of the double diamond, uh, four steps to go through. So we're going to go all the way to the very first diamond and all the way to the first step, which is the discover step. As you can see, that part of the diamond goes like this. It goes divergent, which means that we, means that we practice divergent thinking. So we open up our minds to all the different aspects of the problem in there. And we don't jump to solutions yet or don't try to narrow it down. Which again, it's tricky for us humans. We like to narrow down everything to show that we can make connections real quick. There's no rush, no need to show anything. It's about gathering as much information as possible. That's what the discover phase is about. Now we do this to build empathy with the people we are designing for. Now, for instance, um, let's go back to Denmark, to that example. The people that redesigned that service could just sit back, sit in their office and redesign it from what they think is the best experience, but they haven't gone through the system. If they would have done that, they wouldn't have empathized with the people working in the kitchen, for instance, which means that they would have created a system that still didn't serve the people that were actually making the food. And that would have resulted in a system that in the end probably would be broken again because the people weren't proud of anything that they put out. So building empathy with the people you're designing for and knowing who you're designing for is really important. Because a lot of the times who people think you're designing for or you initially think you're designing for aren't the actual people that you're designing for in the end. Second thing is that would ensure the, that we are serving the needs of our users. Um, I think one important example of that was in, um, in Singapore, where they were designing from the needs of the government, right? They were designing for this is all the information that we need. So let's make the customer go through all these steps. Whereas we want to know what the needs are of the users, the needs are of the customers. They are setting up their new life in a new country. For them, it's not just paperwork. For them, it's a need of um, feeling protected, feeling established, uh, establishing trust. 
if you don't set all of that up in the beginning, how are you going to set that up with the government later on, right? So the need is different that we're solving for. Um, and the end it provides insights that you may not have even been looking for. Just by observing, just by doing research, you'll see that um, things that you thought were working well actually aren't. And things that you thought weren't working well actually are okay. It's not a need, it's not a challenge, it's another opportunity there. Now to illustrate how we conduct design research, I'd like to first talk about market research because most of us are familiar with market research. So market research is, for instance, a survey. Um, if we would do that in the context of the Denmark example, the government asked the design agency to come up with additions to the menu. So the design agency could, go, could um, go, come together, think of all different foods that they'd like to add to it, send out a survey to as many elderly people as possible, and then they would get the truth, which is this food is the one that we need to add, and that's it. Which is a valid way to conduct market research, of course. You have your assumptions, and then you get a validation out of it. Now, that is not really what design thinking says, or how design thinking conducts research, how design research works. Design research, we don't talk to a hundred people. Um, and we also are not looking for validation. We are looking for information. And to get that information, we might talk to less people. And we don't talk about the food that they want, but we talk about the full experience. We talk about the way they're feeling when they get the food. We talk about the feeling beforehand, afterhand. We talk about other things that makes them happy, passions that they have. All of that stuff, we try to get a full picture of what are the different experiences that they go through during a day? What do you do before getting the food? What do you do after getting the food? All of it is important. All of it can be important. Um, and then this way we try to gather as much information as possible, not to validate, just to have a broader picture of the problem that we're dealing with. So what that looks like in practice um, is another example. And for that, I'd like to introduce to you Doc Diet. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Um, Doc was a designer at GE Medical, and he was working on this MRI scan project, improving the MRI scan, which, if you think about it, is a very technical thing, looking at all the ins and outs of the technical aspects of the MRI scan and trying to make it better. Um, and Doc Diet was simultaneously and taking part in courses at Stanford, um, design thinking courses in particular. So at one point he found out about design research and he started looking at the scanner through a different lens, a more human-centered lens. Instead of the ins and outs of the scanner, he started to think of the experience. So he had some observations on what was happening with people around the scans. And what he saw is that a lot of children were going in the scans and a lot of them had to be sedated before going into it because they were scared and stressed of this machine. If you can imagine it's this big white room with this huge cylindrical machine that you have to lay in um, and people in the white lab coats are next to you and it's all very sterile and it is quite frankly pretty scary. And it didn't start, the stress didn't start at the machine. It started at the entrance of the hospital already. It started at the way that they were greeted at the door, which um, was also very technical. So what Doc Deeds did is he mapped this full experience of going through the MRI and he tried to redesign that. And it resulted in this. It resulted in children coming into the hospitals with their parents and being greeted by someone that would guide them through a very magical hallway with paintings all on the walls. Um, almost like a theme park, they were put in line and they were given a different coat and a hat and the people that were working there were wearing pirate coats, for instance, or an eye patch, 
whatever. And the children could slowly see the machine from a distance and they saw this magical thing where they could lie into it and almost take them to a different portal and they got super excited. Um, and they couldn't wait to go into the machine. Um, and instead of, I think about 30% of the people that need to be sedated, now it was two or three people in a year that need to be sedated to go into the machine children which is massive it's a really big change um and it's not just a change financially for the hospital it's also a change for the stress levels of the children for the parents but also the people working there because i'd rather work at a place where people are excited to come into than a place where people need to be sedated to come into so it was improving the lives of a lot of different people that were working in this hospital or not really by designing anything in the machine. The machine was still the same machine. It just had some funny decals on it, but the whole experience was changed. Now, all of this was done by conducting a lot of interviews with doctors, with parents of children and with children itself to really get to the core of what this experience was and how to flip it. So I'd like to give you a few practical tips for this interviewing part that's very crucial in the discovery phase of design thinking. So for interviewing, um, one of the things to keep in mind is that you want to build rapport. It's not like an interrogation room where you put a light on someone's face and you start to fire off questions. It is conversation. You want people to feel comfortable. You want to start with a welcome, with a thank you, make them feel at ease create an environment where they are at ease at, maybe go to um, a coffee shop somewhere where they feel free to talk, all that stuff. The whole experience again ties into the amount of information that you get out of someone. Then what's important to talk about is motivations. It's about what do people care about um, in the experience that you're talking about, in the problem that you're talking about, but also outside of it. What is it that people are excited about? What makes them tick? Because all of that is important to start designing for them. Knowing what they are passionate about, what motivates them is crucial. Um, and then I know we're talking about a problem or a problem space, but we don't want to focus on just the pain points. We want to focus on the delights as well. So both the delights and frustrations need to be met in order to get a full sense of the experience. So there's a few interview techniques that can be used to get the most out of an interview. And these are a few of the steps that you can go through, a few of the tips that we have. Um, one is encourage stories, stories. So make it a conversation, but then go into experiences. Um, ask them about feelings, thoughts, ask them to tell you a story. Um, ask open questions, no yes or no's. Um, we're not trying to look for validation, we're trying to look for information. And generally be curious, generally be interested in what they have to say. Um, have a beginner's mindset. So ask questions, but be positive and energetic about it. Um, and don't seek for confirmation, like I said. Um, ask to be shown something so maybe they can draw something for instance if we talk about the way to school let them draw the way to school right because different things pop up if you make things tangible and then rather it's just um, something that they talk about embrace the silence I think this is one of the most interesting ones because I've done numerous interviews where you ask a question, people give you an answer, they stop talking, you stop talking, and they feel the need to kind of fill in that silence. So then they share something that maybe wasn't in their mind to share in the beginning, but now it's out of the open, right? So the golden nuggets of interviews sometimes come just by being silent at the end and give them room to breathe and room to fill up that silence. Um, and then follow your field guide. It is an, 
a conversation it is an open way of interviewing but you do have, you do want to get to a few answers you do have a field guide you have your hypothesis you have your assumptions and then you build it up in a way that you get to the core of what you want to ask so follow those steps that was the discover phase a lot so maybe pause it grab a sip of coffee and then we'll continue to the define phase as you can see in double diamond define close the diamond define diverges your thinking no sorry define converges your thinking um which means that we have all of this information and now we're going to make sense of it now be careful we're still falling in love with the problem, not with the solution. And this is why this is often the hardest moment in the design thinking process, because we are defining a direction that we're going into without knowing where we're actually going. <laughs> we don't know the destination, we just define direction. So we define the problem that we have and we define what we want to solve for, but we don't necessarily know what the solution is yet. So how do we do that? What are the steps to take? Um, number one is share your findings. So you've done interviews, you've done observations, you've done desktop research, you've written, written article, not written, read articles. Um, and you come back to your group and you share your findings. You then make sense of what you've learned, um, do some sense making, and then you identify opportunities, um, design opportunities. So, you look at all the data, you've made sense of the data, and then you realize these are points that we are interested in, these are points that we see opportunities in. And then you reframe the problem into how might we question. And this can all sound a little bit vague still, so we're gonna go into all the different steps right now. First off, documenting your findings. How do you do that? You have a booklet filled with notes. You um, have an online Word document, Excel file, all of it is everywhere, but then you are there with your group of people, with your team, and you take just like a post-it notes, as design thinking is known for, um, and you write down your findings in this way. You write down your statement of truth, so something that excited you, something that is different, something that is a motivation that someone expressed, something that's part of an experience that something shared, someone shared. You write that down in a concise sentence and then you number your data, which is very important. Um, you number your data and you include the initials of participants or the person you interviewed or of the, of the, of the observation that you've done. And this is because later on we're going to get all the findings together and if one person talks about one thing a lot and is really vocal about one issue and has a lot of different experiences attached to it, we can have a very big data pool from one person which will skew our research and our findings and our sense making, right? So although all the statements of truth are important, we still want to know which statement of truth came from which person so we can kind of filter out the um, real needs and messages behind the experiences people shared. That makes sense. It's just to not skew the data and not to give someone more posts than the other person, one participant more than the other. Then we go into sense making. And we use a tool called Infinity Mapping, and this is the most widely used tool to make sense out of all of the posts that you have. So imagine you have a full Everyone has a stack of post-its and you walk to a wall, or in our case, you go into Mural. So there's online whiteboarding tools for this. Um, and you start to look at all the post-its that people wrote down and start to make sense of it. And the very first thing that you do is just look at similarities, right? A lot of the post-its, a lot of the findings might have similarities in them. There's things that different participants mentioned. So you cluster those together. But then you try to go a little bit deeper into the similarities. What are specific needs that people express that come up a lot? Specific motivations that people expressed that come up a lot? Experiences that people express that come up a lot? You try to 
create clusters of post-its of bindings that share similar backgrounds, similar express needs, express wants, and um, try to dig a little bit deeper into those clusters. So you get clusters um, that are, for instance, uh, in the Danish example, I can imagine one of the clusters was around the um, one wanting to feel proud of the work that you're doing, pride. And um, so the expression of pride could have been a cluster within the affinity maps that they created, that the design team created. This is an interesting observation or interesting thing that came out of the research and that becomes a cluster because a lot of people mention it. Right, so that's one cluster. So then affinity mapping creates different clusters from your research, which looks a little bit like this. So we then give those clusters a title and we've made sense out of our data. This process can take a while and it prompts discussion, um, but it's the moment where we kind of get together and see the results of what we've been talking about. Once we have those clusters, we are going to vote for a cluster that we want to take forward. Now remember that this entity has different steps and there's different ways to do this. I'm going to talk to you about one approach that we do, which is we vote for a cluster that we think has the most opportunity. So the cluster that we think um, we can design for best, the cluster that we think um, had, expresses a need very clearly and expresses an opportunity very clearly. So once we have that, we go into creating an how might we question. And our micro questions are just a different way of phrasing the, uh, the problem into an opportunity. So an example is, for instance, um, if we go back to the Danish example. So the initial question was, how might we improve the municipality food delivery system? Which is such a big question. We don't know, right? And the first answer was to add different food menus, to add different uh, food options to the menu. And after some research, they saw that this feeling of pride is important for people that work in the kitchens and could translate into the full experience of the food delivery service. So now my question is, how might we enable a sense of pride for the people that are preparing the food? And from that moment on, we can start designing. So, if you can see, identifying a lack of pride doesn't give us enough energy or, or space to start designing for it. We just know there's no pride. But then if we flip that around, screen how might we question, we can start designing for it. So it needs to be positive, generative, and actionable question. Um, and it should provide a platform for design, for the design of solutions. And um, it should give us inspiration to start designing from. And so it helps us define a direction. So we went from all the way this to all of the information that we got to a specific thing that we want to tweak and that we want to redesign for. Um, and it reframes these insights into opportunities and it provides a framework for inspiring new ideas. So with that clearly defined how might we question is how we end the very first diamond. That's it, that's a good job. On to the second diamond. Second diamond is all about develop and delivering. So there's again, two steps within the second diamond. I'm gonna first take a closer look at develop. So within develop, we do three things. We generate ideas, and we bring concepts to life through storyboarding, and we get feedback and test it. So if you look at develop, um, again, at the shape, it opens up. It's divergent thinking again. So we have that how might we question, we have that statement, and then we look at all the possibilities that are out there, all the solutions that we can think of that will answer for that how might we question. Now, when we have all those ideas, we, like I said, prototype those to then get feedback from our users or from our customers and then start iterating it. Those are the three simple steps. Um, 
but let's start at the beginning, which is the idea generation. So imagine you're with your team, you have that how micro question, you did an amazing job gathering all those findings, affinity mapping, clustering, picking the cluster, you try different ways of formulating the how might we question until you have the perfect how might we question that everyone is excited about to start ideating around and you write that how might we question on a big piece of paper and you start brainstorming coming up with solutions now there's a few rules to that um, we generally do brainstorming in different rounds so you time box your brainstorming friends you just ask all the participants for five minutes to write down as many ideas as possible around that how might we question on a post-it. You can do that with virtual tools or, um, or just on the post-it itself. Now, when you do this, the very important part is to defer judgment. So for idea generation to take place, we want to feel um, like we're in a safe space. We want to feel like no one is going to judge our ideas. We want to feel like we can be ourselves and we can give all of our ideas to the group. It's all about creating a psychological safety, um, psychological safety in the team, which is a hard thing to do virtually. And that's why we do icebreakers. That's why we get to know each other a little. It's all to feel comfortable enough to share our ideas with each other. Um, so deferring judgment on other people's ideas, super important. In this process, in this step of the process, it's important to encourage wild ideas. You want to go big and bold and far out right now. Because it's always okay to scale back. It's easier to scale back. But it's way harder to push ideas further at a specific point in time down the line. Um, so this is your moment. This is your moment to go bold, to think of those crazy ideas. Later on, we'll think of feasibility. Later on, we'll think of viability. That comes afterwards. Right now, it's about let's get all the crazy ideas on the table. Um, that being said, though, we want to stay focused on the topic. So, of course, you can go as wild as possible, but you're still answering to that how might be question. So, while you do this, keep that in mind. Um, if we do this collaboratively, you want to have one person speaking at a time. It can get quite hectic, but you don't want people to shout over each other. And yeah, it can still be a structured creative process. And you want to be visual, if possible. Now, I know that's a big ask for some people, but why don't you just try to visualize one of your ideas on that post-it instead of writing out what it is. Um, being visual gives you so much more reach to your idea. It can illustrate an idea that you normally need way more words for and in a way that actually um, fits the picture in your head. So you can communicate your ideas even better with the visual tools. Now, diving into visualization is almost a whole topic in itself. We're not going to do that today, but this is the moment where you can try this out. Start being visual, see how it goes. Um, and go for quantity. It's the last one and the last brainstorm rule. And quantity, um, yeah, it's, it kind of ties into this wild idea. So not only do you, do you want to think of as many wild ideas as possible, you want to write down as many ideas as possible because um, you want to get them all out. So I know when you're writing it down, it might not be a perfect idea. You might think this is crazy. You might think this has nothing to do with anything. Keep on writing, get them all out. There's a reason why they're in your head that we want them all out because later on we might be able to build on it. We might be able to twist it a little bit. There's something in that idea that we might take out of it. Everything can be um, valid. That was idea generation brainstorming. We're going to practice that in our workshop later on. Um, <clears throat> so preferably what you have now is you have a crazy pool of ideas either in your computer or on your table. And it's wild ideas, it's ideas that go out there, it's ideas that mm, are really not <laughs> anything good maybe. So we need to make selection, of course. Um, and we have two steps of making selection for this idea, for these ideas. The very first one is the um, individual selection. So you look at your own ideas and other things that you wrote down, and you have three criteria that you use to judge these ideas on. So now we can judge. 
The very first one is inspirational. Look at your ideas and be honest with yourself. Which idea is something that has been tried before? Which idea is something that you've been brought up in meetings already? Which idea is something that you've seen out there? Frankly, you're, it's an idea, but you're kind of tired of it. <laughs> it's something that doesn't give you goosebumps when you talk about it. Then don't pick that idea. Don't go for that idea. Don't go for the easy one. It sounds really relatively easy if I say it like this, but you'd be surprised at how many people play it safe when they go for the idea selection and go for the one that, you know, it's okay. Look for the inspirational ideas. Look for the ones that you want to work for, that you want to work with, that you are excited about. And the rest can go. I'm saying can go, you can always revisit them, but just make that distinction. These are the ones that I'm actually excited about. These are the ones, well, then the second ID selection criteria is connected. So of course, it's amazing if you're inspired, if, if the idea is inspirational, if you're ambitious about it, if it gives you goosebumps, all that stuff, um, but it has to still be connected to the how might we question, right? We try to answer something based on our research. So be honest, does it still answer for that question? If yes, it can go. If no, mm. park it. Last one, relevant. So in connected, we looked, is it still connected to the how might we question? In relevant, we look at the full design challenge and see, does it still fit in there? Like I know that we went on our own journey and we, you know, took maybe a detour uh, in how might we question, but in the end, we are still answering for a certain context. So look at your idea and see if it's still relevant to the overall challenge um, with all the steps that you've taken in between. So you go through all those three ID selection criteria and then you have a set of ideas that you then can bring into the team. And then we go to the second selection phase, which is prioritization. And we use the prioritization metrics for this. Um, as you can see over here, so the prioritization metrics is a really simple tool. It maps effort versus value of your idea. So again, metrics. Um, and you place your ideas on the metrics based on the effort it takes to implement your idea. Now with effort, we just think about um, resources, time, um, amount of people being uh, connected to the idea. So all of the things, does it take a lot of effort? Does it take a lot of mo time, money, and people to implement your idea? If so, higher up the scale. If not, lower. Makes sense. Um, and then we look at the value of your idea. How much of the product portfolio is impacted with your idea? How many people are impacted? with your idea? Is it a big part of their experience that's impacted with your idea of a sm or a small part? All these, th of these things weigh in on whether um, it has high impact and value or low impact. So you and your team place your idea individually on the metrics and then explain both your idea and explain that place on the metrics so that the whole team has an understanding of the ideas and has a grasp of the effort it takes to implement it and the value. Now, once we've done that, we obviously have a great overview of all of our ideas. We have a great overview of their place in the metrics, and then it's just time to make a decision with your team. Probably some ideas have overlap. I mean, we're still answering the same might be question, so I can imagine that a few of them have similar, a um, few of you have similar ideas. So you cluster those again, um, and you end up with a few ideas on the metrics. And then there's different ways to pick the idea. Maybe you give everyone a few votes. Maybe you come to a unanimous conclusion, but you want to take one or two ideas that you want to start making prototypes from. Now that we've made this selection of ideas that we want to evolve, that we want to progress, we're going to deliver. And deliver is just a constant process of testing and iterating and testing and iterating. Um, we do this by creating prototypes. And prototypes are often seen, if you, if you say the name prototype, people think of this elaborate way 
of creating your idea or building it already it's almost already completely built out which is not the case in design thinking a prototype can be as simple as a sketch of your idea that is in itself a prototype it's something that shows your idea and that you can then get feedback on so that's why these two phases um develop and deliver sometimes overlap we create storyboards of our idea that we get feedback on we create sketches of our idea that we get feedback on so it's a constant cycle of testing out different aspects of your idea and then developing that based on um, your feedback so there are different types of prototypes um, mock-ups role-play model storyboards there's a lot so why we do this prototyping is to get early validation so instead of developing an idea all the way to the end we want to get validation um, right away of our initial ideas and just get a feedback because that brings us to the second part it is collaborative so you are creating something with your users and with your customers already instead of you being up in your tower thinking about ideas that people could interact with or could like um, you bring it to the user right away and ask for their feedback and they'll give it to you and you then start designing it together with them almost. It's a collaborative process and it makes so much more sense like, like that way if you think about it. Um, and lastly is hands-on and this is the thing that a lot of people also don't understand until they do it. If you start building something you have to think of different aspects of your idea that you don't think of in your head. A very Simple example is of course a product. You have to make conscious decisions about dimensions of something if you build it. Whereas in your head, those decisions are not being made. But it's the same with um, system that you think of. If you actually have to write down all the different steps, you realize all the gaps that are there. So creating a sketch, creating a roadmap of the system that you've designed prompts you to make decisions that you normally don't think about. So it triggers this other way of thinking and that can only be done by this hands-on approach. So with all that information, a, a, a prototype, the very first one shouldn't be more than $100. Like, please don't spend more than $100 on a prototype in the beginning. It's just your sketch. It can be a, pro, it can be a storyboard, it can be a drawing. It can be a few post-its <clears throat> together that create a story. Depending on what you want to test, that's the aspect of the idea that you want to prototype. If you want to test the interaction between a computer and a human being, just do the role-playing Alexa one. That we don't need to test the look and feel of the product, right? Now we would do. Now we would build just a box and paint it different colors and see how people react. So we can do that. So there's different questions that you can answer with your prototypes. Um, and make sure that you answer for that question. But the very first one doesn't have to be over $100 and it can be created under one hour. Just have that as your rule of thumb. If I create prototypes, the very first one, not over $100, under an hour of work. And like I keep bringing up, storyboarding is an amazing tool to do so. Um, storyboarding is just you showing the flow of your product or service through a storyboard so through six different visualized steps and these different steps um, show different interaction points with the customer and your idea your service your product and um, it shows the experience of the user going through your product so a storyboard has to um, show what need you are serving for the customer. So you go all the way back to the needs that you've identified in your research. What is your product or service or system doing? What is it solving? Um, and that should be the core of your storyboard. It should show the problem that your user has, the user interacting with your product, system, service, whatever, your solution, and then the outcome in six maybe eight that's it steps um, then it should map out the user interaction the user journey and the key interaction points and um, so like I just said what are the most important features um, of your product services system of your solution um, and it should be 
drawn from your user's perspective. So your user going through it. And if you have that, if you have that, you can put it up on the wall or send it over to a colleague and they can give you feedback on your idea right away without you having to tell this full story. It's just six to eight pictures that you drew or that you hacked together with pictures from the internet. And we're gonna try our hand at doing that in um, in the workshop as well. But that is, that's how you create that story, right? Um, and that is it. <laughs> anyway, that's abrupt. That is, those are the, the two main phases of the design thinking process. So it is the problem space and the solution space with the four different steps, discover, define, develop, and deliver. Right, so we went through all of that and um, where in discover, we open up ourselves we think of all the different experiences that people have. We do research into our context. We stick with the problem space. Then in define, we make sense of all the data that we gathered. And we really clearly define the actual problem that we're trying to solve into an how might we question. And once we have that how might we question, we then open it up again and start to think of all the different solutions that are out there, all the different possibilities. Go wild, go crazy. We pick a few and we then start collaboratively testing it and iterating it by creating prototypes to the end product. But remember, that's never the end because it's an iterative process. So even if you have that product, if you have that launch, if we implement that system, there's always feedback that we're gonna get. There's always people interacting with it. There's always users using our product service system or solution. And there's always room to improve. So walking through all those steps, is what the design thinking process is. Um, so design thinking doesn't say that we have to follow that full process linearly. It can be, I use storyboards in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I make sure that I test my ideas with the users. Um, I create room for the psychological safety in my team. Uh, I look at things with an iterative mindset. I know that there's no end trick. Uh, all of these things are design thinking principles. So you don't have to follow this whole process to implement design thinking in your daily life. Like you can adopt some of these mindsets or use some of these tools that I spoke about, implement that within your work and slowly build up this design thinking practice within your system. So that being said, um, there are some next steps. Um, <laughs> We, with the team, have, uh, have, have defined a problem statement um, that we're going to tackle during our workshop. Now, you probably have received that problem statement by now. Um, and my question is to just familiarize yourself with that problem already. Um, the problem statement is, again, just like with the Danish example, um, we have identified a problem statement like that. That doesn't mean that that is the main problem that you want to solve. So explore that concept, that context a bit. Look at articles online. Talk to some people already. We're not asking you to do full on research. We'll do an interview within the workshop, but just come into the session with a, an idea of the context of the problem we're trying to solve. It helps. Um, and you can even go a step further and I want to create some interview questions. Think of some questions that you have for users or for <clears throat> potential customers or for stakeholders um, that we're going to be interviewing in our workshop. And write those down. Look at the tips that we give you on interviewing, open questions, all that stuff, and then just write some initial questions down because you will have the time to ask some questions within the workshop. And then lastly, you'll be guided through an onboarding process. So we're going to send you a link to a video that shows you exactly how to set everything up. That will be me again speaking to you, but it was summer back then, so it's a different setting. <laughs> but same thing, I'm just going to show you how Mural works. That's the online tool that we use and how Zoom works. Um, so make sure to follow that process. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, questions on the onboarding process, but all the questions around this whole webinar that you just saw. So for that, I'd like you to look back at the post that you wrote down in the beginning. The 
expectation that you had um, for this webinar, the objective that you came into this webinar with. Um, and just be honest, have I answered to that expectation? Have I given you all the insights that you needed? Um, if so, that's amazing. If not, um, feel free to ask, reach out, please. Uh, we're all trying to help each other. So reach out, ask me any questions, things that were unclear, um, things that I messed up while speaking to it, um, feel free. Um, and then I think for my part, I hope I've given you enough idea on what the methods are behind design thinking, the mindsets are behind design thinking, the overall process structure. Um, probably have confused you a little bit along the way as well. It's a lot of information. I get that as well. So we're trying to make it tangible and clearer in our workshop. Um, and I'm generally super excited to start doing this workshop um, and to get you all um, practical and hands on with the design thinking process. But that's for another time. For now, thank you so much for listening, for your attention. Um, that's it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you at the interactive workshop.